So thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to the organizers for inviting me uh, and for putting together such a nice conference. Uh, I'm really excited to be here uh, and I'm looking forward to everyone's talks. So I'm going to be telling you about cabordism and a modified Gauss law. Uh, so my talk is based on two papers. The first one is my paper from 2019 with Kamran Vatha. Uh, and this is the paper where we introduce what's become known as the Swampland Cabordism Conjecture, uh, which I'm going to review. But more specifically, the phenomenon I'd like to tell you about um, is something that came up in this paper with Matt Reist from the fall, uh, which was actually phenomenologically motivated. So we were trying to understand some phenomenology. Uh, and in thinking about it more carefully, we ran into this phenomenon, this modified Gauss law, uh, and that's what I want to tell you about. Uh, so the, this modified Gauss law in cobordism uh, is a gravitational version of something that's very familiar. So I thought I would give you an example that's very familiar to this audience uh, and then work by analogy. Uh, so this is a textbook example, as we all know, uh, the D3 brain world volume supports a dynamical U1 gauge field, uh, which has charged magnetic particles, which are the ends of D1 strings. And if the D3 brain world volume graphs a three cycle on which we've turned on K units of NSNS flux, uh, then we have a modified Gauss law. So the normal Gauss law for magnetic monopoles would say that the net amount of magnetic charge in a closed manifold uh, should vanish because each monopole radiates magnetic flux. That magnetic flux goes through the manifold and it has to end somewhere and it has to end on an equal and opposite charge. Uh, but in the presence of this background, uh, we have a modified Gauss law uh, and we have to have precisely K D1 strings ending at points in M3. Uh, this is what this paper of Malvis, Moore and Seiberg taught us uh, in 2001. And this can be viewed as a version of anomaly inflow. Uh, the U1 gauge field on the world volume uh, is electrically charged under B2, the NSNS gauge field. Uh, and so it transforms non-trivially. And you can understand this non-trivial transformation as leading to the modified Gauss law in the presence of a background. So my goal today is that I'm going to replace everything in sight uh, with, spa with the space-time manifold. So the essential difference between quantum gravity and quantum field theory uh, is that in quantum gravity, the space-time manifold is a dynamical degree of freedom. Uh, it's something that can fluctuate. Uh, and so it's going to play the role of every player uh, in this story. And so we're going to get a version, a purely gravitational version of a modified Gauss law. There we go. Uh, so to, to look ahead, uh, the dictionary I'm going to set up is that I'm going to replace magnetic flux of the U1 gauge field with geometric flux, namely with the space-time topology uh, around some object. Uh, the, the objects which radiate magnetic flux are magnetic monopoles, and the objects which radiate geometric flux are what's called cobordism defects. And this is the, these are the objects that are predicted by the cobordism conjecture, uh, which I'll review. Uh, so how do we get a modified Gauss law? Um, so in the first example, we got it by turning on an NSNS flux. Uh, and in the case of cobordism, we're going to get a modified Gauss law by turning on a non-trivial normal bundle. And I'll explain what that means. Uh, so the outline of my talk, I'm going to start by reviewing the Swampland cobordism conjecture. I'm going to tell you what a cobordism defect is uh, and why they should satisfy even the naive version of a Gauss law. Uh, and then I'm going to demonstrate by way of examples this modified Gauss law. So my first example uh, is going to be what's known as Nelson Barr models. This is a beyond standard model particle physics model. Um, and this is the example where we first found this phenomenon. Uh, and then I'm going to give you another example that's maybe closer to the heart of this conference, uh, which is a very simple example in F-theory. Uh, and depending on time, and I'm, I'm guessing I won't, but we'll see, I'll make a connection to the atom spectral sequence. Keep clicking the wrong one. OK, uh, so let's review the Swampland cobordism conjecture. Uh, so the first question you ask uh, to lead to the cobordism conjecture is to ask whether there are any topological charges associated to the space-time manifold. Uh, so as I said before, the space-time manifold is dynamical in quantum gravity. And as a dynamical degree of freedom, it can carry conserved charges. Uh, and the mathematically precise way to describe these charges is cobordism. So if I have two manifolds of the same dimension, uh, M1 and M2, I can ask whether there's a way to get from M1 to M2 uh, by a sequence of dynamically allowed topology changes. Uh, so you can view that sequence as sort of stills of a video, or you can take the manifold traced out by that process uh, and form a manifold of one dimension higher, which has an incoming boundary M1 and outgoing boundary M2, 
uh, and this is what's known as a cobordism. Now, we usually care about more structure on our manifolds than just their sort of point set topology. Uh, if our degrees of freedom uh, depend on more structure, uh, such as an orientation or a spin structure, uh, then we're going to fix that structure and look at k-dimensional manifolds with x structure up to x preserving topology changes. Uh, and the set of equivalence classes forms an abelian group where the group operation uh, is disjoint union. Uh, and the basic observation is that cobordism defines a global symmetry uh, of semi-classical gravity. So this is really not a swampland statement so far. This is just a fact about uh, semi-classical the semi-classical gravitational path integral. Uh, and why is it a global symmetry? Well, definitionally, the cobordism class uh, of a closed slice of spacetime is invariant under any possible process uh, by definition of cobordism. Uh, so it's a conserved charge. Uh, and it's a global charge because it's defined on a closed manifold. One day I'll figure out which one to play. Um, so to get to the cobordism conjecture, we need to apply a swampland principle. Uh, and the swampland principle is just no global symmetries. It's the most basic swampland conjecture. Um, and so we learned that if you have no global symmetries, in particular, you don't have these global symmetries. Uh, and we learned that any UV complete theory of quantum gravity uh, once we take into account all non-perturbative effects and all non-perturbative objects that exist in the theory, uh, then we should have trivial cobordism groups taking everything into account. Uh, this version of the, state of the conjecture is a bit aspirational uh, because I don't think anyone here can claim to knowing all non-perturbative objects in string theory. Um, so in practice, what we do is we say we have a semi-classical description that makes sense on manifolds with some structure. We compute cobordism groups. We find that they're non-zero. Uh, and so we predict that the complete theory has some new defects, uh, like I've drawn here, which trivialize the otherwise non-trivial cores of classes. Uh, so in the UV complete theory, we have more objects that allow us to connect more manifolds than we could before. Uh, and there are tons of examples. Uh, I think the simplest one, just for sort of intuition, is orientifold planes. Um, and I'll also point you to Miguel and Marcus's talks to talk about uh, a more wide spectrum of objects predicted by the cobordism conjecture, uh, some of them known and some of them unknown currently in string theory. So for the purpose of my talk, the essential feature of cobordism defects is that they carry a topological gauge charge. Uh, so I'll call back to the example of U1 gauge theory. So monopoles break the magnetic symmetry of the U1 gauge field, and are they themselves charged under the dynamical gauge field? Uh, and so cobordism defects break a global symmetry and they themselves carry a gauge charge. Uh, how can we describe this gauge charge? Well, one way is to tell you how to detect the object inside of a black brain. Uh, so if I have a black brain and I wanna know if there's a cobordism defect inside, I go to the horizon, I measure the topology uh, and I evaluate the cobordism class. And if it's non-zero, then I learn that inside of that black brain, there's a cobordism defect. Uh, and this is sort of the geometric flux radiated by a cobordism defect. Uh, there's also a Gauss law, a naive Gauss law, which says that the net number of cobordism defects transverse to a closed slice should vanish. Uh, so I'm going to make a uh, modified version of the usual argument for Gauss's law. Uh, so suppose I have a closed slice, which is the union of this W and a bunch of little cobordism defects. I want to argue that the sum of the charges, so each cobordism defect radiates some manifold, M1, M2, M3, and I want to argue that the sum of those vanishes in cobordism, and it's an easy calculation, so we say that the sum of those classes is the class of the disjoint union, which is precisely the boundary of a smooth manifold with no cobordism defects, and so we learn that the net charge cancels. This is just saying that each defect radiates a geometric flux, and that geometric flux has to end somewhere on another cobordism defect. Uh, so this is sort of a standard story. Um, and the point I want to emphasize in this talk is that there's a hidden assumption here. Uh, and the hidden assumption is that the, the normal bundle to the slice we're looking at, so the slice we're looking at is a slice through space-time, and we're assuming that this normal bundle is trivial. And we'll see in examples that if you weaken this assumption, you get a modified Gauss law. Uh, so the first example I want to look at are Nelson-Barr models. Uh, these are a particle physics model that I'll review briefly. 
So they tried to, their one approach to resolving the strong CP problem. Uh, so the fact is that experimentally, we've seen that our universe has order one amounts of CP violation. Uh, but one of the parameters that could violate CP, the QCP theta angle, uh, is ridiculously small. It's smaller than something like 10 to the minus 10, uh, which looks ridiculously unnatural. And so the idea of Nelson and Barr uh, is to promote either CP or parity. Um, for my purposes, it won't matter which we're talking about, although obviously phenomenologically it matters. I'm going to promote it to an exact symmetry, in fact, a gauge symmetry, uh, and suppose that it's spontaneously broken at low energies. And why am I telling you about some particle physics model? Well, I claim that Nelson Barr models have a nice description in terms of cobordism. So the low energy theory uh, below the scale of CP or, or parity violation uh, is a chiral theory. Um, it is something like the standard model. Uh, and so it depends on an orientation. To put it on a manifold, I have to choose an orientation. But the high energy theory is parity symmetric, and so it makes sense on non-orientable manifolds. Uh, and the difference in the structure of manifolds between the two descriptions uh, means that Nelson Barr models naturally contain a cobordism defect. Um, and this cobordism defect was actually much discussed in the Fino community. Uh, they didn't call it a cobordism defect, uh, but it's an object called a parity domain wall. So we've spontaneously broken a discrete symmetry. And so we have a domain wall where on one side you could have, say, a left-handed standard model, and on the other side you have a right-handed standard model. Um, and so I claim that this object is a cobordism defect. It's the defect in the orientation structure. Um, and it carries a topological gauge charge. So what is the geometric flux radiated by the domain wall? Well, it radiates the cobordism class of two oriented points, which is a non-trivial class in oriented bordism. Uh, so in other words, if we had a parity domain wall inside a black domain wall, what we could do is we could go to the two horizons and measure the orientation and compare them and determine whether or not there's a parity domain wall inside. Uh, so the kid has a geometric flux and there's also a Gauss law. And the Gauss law is just the standard fact that every one manifold happens to be orientable. So every one manifold is just a disjoint union of circles, and the circle happens to be orientable. Uh, and this means the net number of parity domain walls on an abstract one manifold uh, should vanish mod two. So this is a mod two Gauss law. Uh, what I've drawn here uh, is that I have a circle, and I've put two parity domain walls. Uh, and hopefully you can see that in order to have a consistent orientation away from the domain walls, uh, there has to be an, an even number. There were an odd number, we couldn't define the orientation away from the parity domain walls. Uh, I'll just briefly mention that the fact that the parity domain wall carries a gauge charge uh, tells us something about phenomenology. Um, it tells us that parity domain walls being objects charged under a gauge symmetry uh, are exactly stable. If they decay to something, whatever that, the thing they decay to is some other domain wall, which is also a parity domain wall, so they're essentially stable. Uh, and this is a big problem for cosmology. So essentially, uh, the problem is that if you produce exactly stable domain walls in the early universe, uh, they would come to dominate the energy density. We look up in the sky and we don't see them. Uh, so you have to explain them uh, away. Maybe you have to inflate them away if you like inflation um, or whatever. In, in some sense, you have to deal with them. So this is the normal Gauss law for parity domain walls. Now let's see a modified Gauss law. Uh, well, what I said before was that to see a modified Gauss law, I have to turn on a non-trivial normal bundle. So rather than look for the number of parity domain walls in a one manifold that's just an abstract one manifold, uh, let's put it inside an ambient space-time. Uh, so here I've drawn a circle that's sitting inside some ambient space-time uh, where the little blue arrows denote the normal bundle or part of the normal bundle. You could think of this as the center circle of a Mobius band. Uh, and if you look for configurations of parity domain walls in the ambient manifold, uh, you find that there's an odd number transverse to this circle uh, because the first Stiefel Whitney class of the ambient space time uh, is non zero on this circle. Uh, what's happening uh, is hopefully clear. Um, instead of having a parity flip when you go around the circle, you've had a parity flip in the normal directions. Uh, and you can view this as a version of anomaly inflow. Uh, the ambiguity uh, is an ambiguity in defining the cobordism class uh, of a point inside an, an ambient man manifold, which is oriented. 
So if I want to induce an orientation on a point in an ambient space, I have to choose a normal framing. Uh, and if I flip that normal framing, the orientation of the point flips. Uh, and this is a uh, sort of anomaly. And it's very analogous to the fact that the U1 gauge field on a D-brain transforms under the NSNS field. OK, so that's my first example. Uh, let me give you another example to show that this is maybe more generic than might be expected. Um, and so this example will be an F theory. So as before, we need two descriptions. So we have one description that's sort of the naive description and a more complete description, uh, which will include a cobordism defect. Uh, although, I'll, again, I'll point you to Miguel and Marcus's talks for a more refined version of precisely this story. Um, the naive version uh, is that perturbative type 2b string theory uh, contains fermions. And so naively, it seems like it should make sense uh, on a manifold with spin structure. But non-perturbatively, we know that there are F-theory backgrounds. Uh, and F-theory only requires a spin structure on the total space, not on the base. And its spin structure on the total, uh, the total space uh, turns out to be equivalent to a spin C structure on the base. Uh, and this is a weaker structure. Every spin manifold is spin C, but not every spin C manifold is spin. And so F-theory contains a cobordism defect uh, relative to perturbative type 2b. Uh, what is this defect? It's what I'm going to call a spin vortex. Uh, so this is a vortex. It's an object of codimension 2, meaning it's a 7 brain. Uh, and when you go around this object, it's defined by the property that fermions pick up an additional minus sign uh, than they would otherwise. Uh, I can also describe that in terms of the geometric flux radiated by this defect, uh, which is the coordism class of a circle with the periodic spin structure, the supersymmetric spin structure, uh, which is a non-trivial class in bordism of spin 1 manifolds. And in F theory, this is realized by a very familiar configuration. Uh, it's realized by the sort of stringy cosmic strings uh, picture where you have 12 singular fibers uh, around here, uh, which has total deficit angle two pi, meaning that the geometry here is cylindrical. Uh, and this cylindrical geometry, you can think of as being, as being related to the fact that fermions uh, around this circle uh, have periodic spin structure, oh, sorry, periodic boundary condition. Uh, so we have a cobordism defect, and we have a geometric flux. So what's the Gauss law? Well, the Gauss law tells us that elliptic vibration over a Riemann surface, if we demand that the total space is spin, uh, then this elliptic vibration has to have a multiple of 24 singular fibers. Uh, so I said that 12 singular fibers was a uh, spin vortex. And so if we have to have a multiple of 24, we have an even number of spin vortices. So vanishes mod 2. Uh, as an example, uh, we have a very familiar configuration, F theory on K3 elliptically fibered over P1. Uh, and there's 24 singular fibers, 12 here, 12 here. Uh, and this comprises two spin vortices. So this is the normal Gauss law. What about a modified Gauss law? So instead of looking at elliptic vibration over an abstract Riemann surface, we can look at elliptic vibration over a Riemann surface in an ambient manifold. So suppose we have a minus one curve in the base. Say we're looking at F theory on a Calabi-Yau threefold. Um, this minus one curve, because it has self-intersection minus one, has a non-trivial normal bundle. Uh, in fact, the normal bundle is non-spin, so it, it, it doesn't admit a spin structure. Um, and so this means that the elliptic vibration, as is also well known, has only 12 singular fibers. Uh, and this is a single spin vortex transverse to a closed surface. Um, in terms of the deficit angle, you have both the deficit angle of the base as well as the curvature of the normal bundle. And again, uh, this can be understood as anomaly inflow. Uh, the cobordism class of a circle in an ambient spin manifold, uh, usually we think that the cobordism class of a circle is either defined by periodic or anti-periodic boundary condition. Uh, but if we only have a circle in an ambient spin manifold and we twist the framing as we go around the circle by two pi, uh, then those two cobordism classes will switch with each other. And so again, this is a version of anomaly inflow. Um, how am I doing on time? <laughs> no problem. Oh, OK, more than I expected. Sorry? OK, so I'll tell you uh, now about the connection with the atom spectral sequence. Um, so in both of the examples uh, that I've discussed, uh, we have cobordism defects, which are being measured by a characteristic class. Uh, so in the first case, we have parity domain walls, uh, which are defects in the orientation structure. And they're measured by the first Stiefel-Whitney class. 
Uh, in the second case, we have spin vortices, which are defects in the spin structure, uh, and they're measured by the second steeple Whitney class. Uh, and in both, I want to describe the commonalities. In both cases, we have a characteristic class, which is a non-trivial characteristic class uh, of the fundamental description. So unoriented manifolds, the first steeple Whitney class of an abstract unoriented manifold uh, is a non-trivial characteristic class. Uh, and W2 of, a, of an abstract spin C manifold is also a non-trivial characteristic class. Um, in particular, the first one measures uh, cycles with non-trivial uh, non-orientable normal bundle. And the second one measures two manifolds with non-spin normal bundle. But both of these characteristic classes happen to vanish on abstract manifolds of the same dimension as the characteristic class. Uh, so the two facts are that all possibly unoriented one manifolds uh, happen to be orientable. Uh, their first equal Whitney class vanishes. Uh, and all spin C two manifolds happen to be spin. Uh, just you could think of it by as by accident, but in any case, their second steeple Whitney class vanishes. Uh, and so what we have, the scenario we have is that we have a non-trivial characteristic class, uh, which does not appear in the cobordism group of the same dimension. So you could try to define a cobordism invariant uh, as the integral of the, the characteristic class. Um, but that, that cobordism invariant will be trivial. It'll vanish on all manifolds of the same dimension. Uh, and so this phenomenon of having a non-trivial characteristic class that fails to appear in cobordism uh, is precisely what's described by what's known as the atom spectral sequence. So I'm not going to try to tell you what a spectral sequence is. Um, there's some mathematical machinery. We might hear about them later, although I'm not sure. Um, but the atom spectral sequence is a mathematical tool that lets you that where you're given the set of characteristic classes and you're asked to compute the cobordism groups. Um, and I also want to point out that the original story, uh, the, this paper of uh, Malvasena, Moore, and Seiberg uh, describing D-brains in NSNS flux is also described by a spectral sequence. In that case, it's the atia Hirzberg spectral sequence. Uh, and this describes how D-brain charges are measured in KO or K-theory or KO theory. And it takes the modified Gauss law into account. So again, we have a spectral sequence, which takes the modified Gauss law into account. Uh, and as I said, I don't want to try to describe what a spectral sequence is, but I'll try to draw some pictures. Um, so what I'm drawing here is pictures of potential cobordism classes. Uh, and the essential feature is that there's a thing called a differential uh, that's connecting two classes. And I want to give this differential the interpretation uh, as saying that one object radiates another geometric flux. So here we have W1. Uh, W1 counts parity domain walls. And it's connected by a differential to a class here, uh, which it turns out to be the same as the class of two oriented points. Uh, so this differential tells you that a parity domain wall radiates two oriented points. And what do you do with the differential? Well, you eliminate both of these classes from your cobordism. Uh, and this is related to the cobordism of zero uh, unoriented zero manifolds is only Z2. Uh, and there's no cobordism class corresponding to W1 for spin C. Uh, we have a differential here, which connects the class W2, which counts the number of spin vortices, uh, to the class H1. Uh, H1 is the class of a uh, circle with periodic boundary conditions for the fermions. Uh, and I may have been a little fast, but uh, this is what I had to say. Uh, so thank you so much for listening. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Very nice. So, like, the question of the slide where you relate atoms to, you know, the differential in atoms, the other Is there something about atoms? Like, I couldn't, I thought maybe in the same, we have the spectral sequence, and not what makes atoms special. That's a good question. I think, yes, spectral sequences in general describe the ways in which, you know, objects of one dimension can end on objects of another dimension, which is also the sense of objects of one dimension are charged under gauge fields of another dimension. Um, but at the atom spectral sequence very specifically is the one that describes the, uh, the fact that a characteristic class can fail to appear in cobordism, right? Precisely the one that goes from characteristic classes to cobordism. Um, and so that's, that's this specific effect I'm talking about in this talk. Um, yeah, I, maybe to, to make a, a, a comment and speculation, so I, I don't know what the, the totally general story is, um, 
you'll see that both of these examples are a differential on the E1 page originating in the first row. Uh, I don't know whether other differentials also have this interpretation, but I'd, I'd love to, to think about it and figure it out. Yeah. The first row is the one that can be represented by yeah, I, I, I'd like to understand as well, just to maybe repeat the, the point that the first row is ones captured by characteristic classes, while the higher ones are things like indices of operators. Actually, I think the first one is like, well, some of them are indices of operators. There may be more general things. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I, one, one thing to say is that I know one place where you could have a cobordism defect, which would never satisfy a Gauss law. So an orientifold plane, uh, an orientifold plane radiates at RPN, um, and RPN will appear in the first row. So the cobordism defect would appear in the negative first row if it's going to hit it with the differential. Um, and RP2, there's no ambiguity, right? There's no possibility that by changing the normal bundle, my RP2 is now magically not RP2. Uh, so some, sometimes cobordism defects are not subject to this ambiguity, and sometimes they are. Um, and I think you can also view this ambiguity as some sort of higher group structure uh, between space-time symmetries and cobordism symmetries. But yeah, I'd like to understand it better. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, short answer is I don't know. Um, I mean, there, there's a couple of things that you might hope it might be. There, there's, there, I'll give you some very vague speculation. Um, there's some sense in which manifolds that appear in higher rows of, higher, uh, rows of the atom spectral sequence are like less positively curved. And as you go down, they become more positively curved. So one example is that, uh, you know, real projective planes appear on the bottom row and things like K3 and supersymmetric circles appear higher up. Uh, so in some sense, it might be related to number of conserved supercharges, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a great question. Sure. So I'll, I'll say more about this. So the the what we're saying is that parity domain walls are exactly stable. So there were some earlier papers where people had speculated about a parity cosmic string, where when you go around the cosmic string, you pick up a parity flip, and that would destabilize the domain walls. Uh, what this shows is that parity strings are are not a thing. <laughs> Uh, there's no geometry or topology you can write down a co-dimension to. Um, and so if you want a realistic Nelson bar model, you have to get rid of the parity domain wall somehow. So either you need to inflate them away, uh, which is maybe an issue, uh, not just theoretically, it's also an issue phenomenologically because you need low scale inflation uh, in order to, in, if your parity, if your scale of CP violation is low, you need low scale inflation. Um, maybe you don't like inflation, uh, but then you have to explain the way some other way. Um, yeah. Sorry? Well, as Cameron and I were actually discussing this when I, we were discussing it the other week, and um, if your scale of CP violation is like the Planck scale or something, then maybe there's no way around, but really it's pretty constrained. So, <laughs> yeah. oh, uh, thank you. I'm a little confused. Sorry, uh, uh, one interesting thing I might have concluded from your talk uh, was that the correct uh, thing for the uh, topology chain in semi classical quantum gravity is not the border. Because who says the normal bundle has to be trivial? I should consider other. Yeah, that, that, that's a great that's a that's a great question, and and there's some confusion actually related to precisely this question about whether wormholes break symmetries. Um, people sometimes say that wormholes break symmetries. I don't think that's actually true. What wormholes do is, if you if you allow replica wormholes and you impose that the 
replica worms will give the right answer, then you break symmetries. Um, it, it, it's a question about how you define your path integral. So when you want to describe the charges of states, uh, you should look at states in the Hilbert space or a higher categorical analog of a Hilbert space. Uh, and in order to define that, you need to choose an arrow of time. So you need to choose a, a direction to quantize in. Um, and that gives you your normal framing when you talk about charges. Um, and it's related to the fact that when you have a cobordism, the manifolds that come into it have a normal framing, which is this arrow of time. So maybe there's a debate to be had, but I, I don't know. This is the one that makes sense to me. Yeah. Thank you. On this note, 